for taking the time out of your day to be here tonight. Uh, you will see I am absolutely not a technical photographer. There's people running to fix the mic. Thank you. I will shout really, really loud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, working? Yeah. Are you hearing the fine? Okay. okay. All right. And can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So when I was 19, I used to babysit a six years old kid, coolest kid ever. And one night we were watching TV and a pianist came up on screen and he looked at me and said, Sarah, I can't wait to have my own piano. I asked him if he could play the piano and he shrugged and said, I don't know, I haven't tried yet. And this to me sums up like every kid everywhere. They just go for it. They don't, they make up entire universes in their own, in their own little heads. Adults on the other side, when it comes to creativity especially, they get really embarrassed about the idea of doing something creative. They usually say that they don't have the talent for it, right? And here's the thing. I, I really think that creativity is not a talent. I think creativity is a skill. And it's not something you have or you don't have. It's something that you use or you, or you lose. Like if you can play the piano and you don't touch it for the next 20 years, you cannot expect to just touch the key and start where you left, right? And that's what a lot of people do with creativity. They stop being creative when they stop being children and then they never pick it up. And if, you, if all it takes is practice, why don't people practice? Well, the excuse most people give me is that they're waiting for inspiration. And here's the other word I really don't like, inspiration. Like when people talk about inspiration, they have this whole scenario in their head. It's something that washes over you, takes over your brain, and then makes you do something amazing. And then it goes away, and you have to wait for it to come back. And when people talk about it, they have, they describe it in a way that is like walking through the woods at night, and it just stops snowing, and everything is peaceful and quiet and almost magical. And a white deer comes up and, and look at you right in the eyes, and you feel like you're part of the whole world or something. Well, in my experience, inspiration is more like getting up at 3 a.m. and it's raining outside and it's cold, but you have to go hunt a deer. So you spend hours chasing, like looking for tracks, and eventually you find a deer and you shoot an arrow and you hit, but the deer doesn't die, it just runs away. So now you have to go chase the deer and hopefully you will find it. And when you do, you have to put an end to its misery by killing it with your own bare hands. And then now you have a dead deer and you're very far away from home. So you have to drive the carcass all the way back so that you can gut it and it's smelly and it's messy and you can skin it and you can cook it for your friends and family so they can appreciate your creativity. <laughs> and believe me, they will, one of them will say something like, I wish I could do what you do, but I just don't have the talent, you know? And I hate this metaphor because, I mean, I'm a vegetarian, but that's... <laughs> but I've never find anything that describes what I feel the creative process is better. If you, if you do, please send me an email. I really appreciate it. Um, so if it's all about hard work and, like, where do idea come from? Like, wouldn't it be awesome if there was some sort of mathematical formula that we could use that would make idea happen? Well, likely for you, I have it because I made it up. And the formula goes as this, like ideas is input, input plus time over social media multiplied by monkeys. <laughs> I will proceed to explain. <laughs> we will start with the input part. Uh, most photographers, when they look for inspiration, they go on the internet and they open Flickr or 500px or you know, stuff like that. And it cannot only be photos. Like, if a photo is a slice of life, what you are doing is experiencing secondhand life of someone else. It's like me writing a travel book about India and I've never been there. Sure, I can go and look it up on the internet and write some stuff and most of it is gonna be accurate because I'm a good researcher. But I might say something really stupid without noticing it just because I've never been there. If you want to have more interesting photos, 
have a more interesting life. <laughs> <laughs> kind of easy, right? So, and of course, there's a lot of stuff that it's not just life that can inspire you. And there is a lot of stuff that inspires me. And it's not just photos. It's going to be movies and books and music and architecture and sculpture and dance. And if you, if you know me and if you know my work, you will see all of these things. You will see uh, traces of Dave McKean's uh, graphic novels. You will see um, David Fincher. You will see like, Beethoven. Like, and if you keep it like really wide, and if you make it active especially, like it's not just being exposed to stuff. It's actively going out there and searching for something you have never seen before. Like coming to Dubai and going out with friends and trying food I've never tasted before. And there's a lot of things, like practical things you can do, like watch a movie and not just what's on at the multiplex, like the next town, like something that's, that has been shot in the 60s and you've never heard about. Or read a book, not just books about photography written by photographers, for photographers. <laughs> like we tend to get a little bit referen auto-referential. Uh, listen to music or even better, go to a concert. Um, spend time inside awesome architecture, meet new people, uh, talk to strangers. I know your mom told you not to, but I'm not your mom. And the fun stuff happens when you're not your mom. So, uh, visit new places. Like, I love traveling and being exposed to new people. Like, it makes you think, in, it opens your mind, it makes you think in new ways. Like, even go to really, different cultures, one, uh, ones that you thought, you think something about them, go there and notice how different people are. Um, go for a walk, take a nap, naps are good. If there were not Olympics, I'd be gold champion, like gold medal every year, four years. Uh, and sure, look at amazing photos, like go out, about, go to a museum, like go to a gallery. Try to look at, it's like, it's like you know, rubbish in, rubbish out, so try to increase the level of the stuff you, you look at. Um, and after you've done that, start collecting it. Start stealing little pieces here and there and keep them for reference. Um, and even if you don't know why you like something, at first just start keeping it. And you can do it in like so many ways. You can use Pinterest. I will talk a little bit about this like right now, but there are just Evernote, Dropbox, just make a folder, call it interesting, interesting stuff and drop stuff in there. Uh, use an actual box if you like take photos from magazine or articles you're interesting uh, to. Journal, like I have always pen and paper on you to write about stuff you find interesting or just attach physical object to a piece of paper and keep it. And I use Pinterest a lot. Uh, most of my girl friends use it. Most of my uh, guy friends have no idea what it is. <laughs> and they go check it and they see a lot of stuff about weddings and nails and makeups and they run away. But it's actually a really interesting tool. It's basically a place where you go, you create these things called mood boards and you just drop images in from either from other Pinterest uh, mood boards or from the internet. And I use it for, like, I keep references for, well, food or um, uh, products I like. But the most important thing for me is that one there, the moment before I fall asleep, it's a board where I put everything that I find that I think talks about me, that I think matches my aesthetic, my vision, that I think matches my identity. Even if it's not done by me, it's still me. And um, if you know me, um, you see that, and you go through that, you see myself in it, you see my work in it. And it also has a practical reason to be. I, um, whenever I find like makeup I like, or um, like hair I like, I keep it there so that when I work with the creative team, I can give them references. Because the thing is, words are amazing, I'm a huge word nerd, but if I say to my makeup artist, I want something elegant, they might have a completely different idea of what elegant is. And I, believe me, I've learned this the, the hard way. 
Um, so this is an, an example of a mood board I use for an actual photo shoot. And I will use um, paintings, uh, illustration, or photos uh, just to give an idea to everyone working with me what I'm going for. And this is not only because I want them to do a good job and I want them to understand what I want from them. They also, if, I, if they know what I want, they might also bring something else to the table. They might say, you know what, I have this dress and I think it would be perfect. And I like to actually collaborate with the people um, I work with. And the result of that uh, was a bunch of photos like this. This was actually shot in David Hobby's backyard. Uh, <laughs> in a kiddie pool, like the actual inflatable kiddie pools that you get for 50 bucks on Amazon. Um, what I did is I put a plastic sheet, like a black plastic sheet uh, on the kiddie pool and then I filled it with water, but just like, like that. So the model is not uncomfortable and she's not drowning and she doesn't have to stay afloat. She's just laying there. And um, I did the headpiece, it's just very cheap uh, fabric flowers and a glue gun. I think everyone should own at least a couple of glue guns. That's <laughs> like really important. Um, the dress I did myself, I just found fabric that I like and it's not good. Like it's not something you would wear outside. I'm not a good seamstress at all. But it still it works on pictures and as photographers, all we need is for something to look good from one side for a fraction of a second. That's all we need. Um, a lot of people don't want to look for too many references because we are afraid of being influenced, which is like kind of silly because you are going to be influenced by everything that happens around you, so just make it better. So go out. Borrow, steal, appropriate. Don't try to be original. Everything has already been done. Probably better. <laughs> but nobody is you. Nobody has your background, your point of view, your aesthetic. So it's going to be different. Think about music. Think about covers. Think about Jolene, sang by Dolly Parton, and Jolene sang by the White, the White Stripe. It's not even the same song. Or heard by Nine Inch Nail and heard by Johnny Cash. And even if Johnny Cash didn't write that song, when he sings it, it's, it belongs to him. The thing is, if you take the same word and the same music, you, should really, you usually should not call it with a different name, so you just say, I'm doing a cover. But you can see how many um, groups are influenced by other groups, and they just make new songs with that inspiration. Or uh, movies. Avatar is basically Pocahontas in space. Like, it's the same, it's the exact same story. But even, like, if you think about um, art history, um, Picasso, which is one of the most original artists that's there, that, that ever was, um, is inf was influenced by, uh, for example, uh, from Rousseau. He learned uh, about archaic tribal art, and he was inspired by African masks. You can see that in every, like, the Demoiselle d'Avignon, like, you can see the African mask influence. Um, or the three-dimensional form in Paul Cezanne. So, if photography is a language, if you've taken any of my workshop, you're sick of hearing it, but I really strongly believe it is. Uh, your references become your accent, and you kind of cannot get rid of it, and you might have noticed I'm kind of Italian, a little bit, but <laughs> while you improve yourself, while you're, you keep talking, you keep listening, it gets better and people understand you better. And that's the same with reference. You start by doing something that's really, really, really like someone else did. And after a while, if you keep your reference coming, you start developing your own voice, which is what you want to do. And you have to have enough diver diverse reference, but you also need to give it time to grow. To grow. And this brings us to the next um, element of our formula, time. And it's kind of weird living in these times because in 2016 we are supposed as photographers to keep shooting like new work, amazing work every day and everything is fast and everything is like you have to keep doing, keep going. And most of the stuff I do is like that, like you get like commercial work and it pays the job and it pays the bills and then you ha it has to be done by yesterday usually. 
Uh, and six months from now, nobody is going to care about that. It's basically disposable. So that's not what you want. When you're talking about creativity, it's not what you should aim for. And developing a creative vision might take years, might take decades. I'm, no, I'm not done. I, I'm never, I'm not never even year, near when I want to be. But I'm getting there, and I know it will take time. And uh, this is a part of a project that I made. is a, it, It's called Magpies, and it's a 168 pages long graphic novel that I illustrated with photos. Every single panel is basically a photo that has been printed, um, cut out, set in a cardboard diorama, and then photographed again. And it took forever. Like it took more than nine months working from 9 a.m. to 4 a.m. the next morning and starting again the next day. And it's probably the thing I'm the most proud of because I took the time to make it right. I could have done a really quick job of it and it, could have, it would have been still kind of creative, but it wouldn't have been what I wanted it to be. The main excuse I hear from people is that they don't have time. They have families, they have jobs, they have this and that. And the thing is, you will never, ever have time. You have to make time. Um, I book myself. Basically, I decide that I want to work on something, and I might say, you know what, next Friday for the whole afternoon, I'm doing that. And when someone else tries to book me, I, I do what I would do if another client booked me. I say, I'm sorry, I cannot. Can we do that on Monday? And you know what, it works. It's just this easy. Um, you always try to, you should always try to separate work from consumption. And by this, I mean, well, first of all, um, being here is not photography. Watching tutorials on YouTube is not photography. Reading about photography is not photography. Photography is taking a camera, going out there, and shooting. So you think you're learning, but unless you actually put that into practice, you are not. You just, you're just, I mean, it's enjoyable and it's useful, but everything you learn, just go out there and practice. And again, it takes time. And I also mean this in another way. When you are working, do not think at the people who are going to, cons to consume your work. That will drive you crazy. That will make your work so much watered down because you cannot please everybody. And if you try to think of how people would perceive what you do while you are doing it, it's, gonna, it's not going to come out right. There's a quote that I love by Kurt Vonnegut that goes, Right to please just one person. If you open a window and make love to the world, so to speak, your story will get pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And I think it applies to photographers as well. And again, if you start thinking about photography as language, everything that has been written for writers applies to photography. My favorite photography manual is, book, is a book called Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. And of course it's about creative writing, but a lot of the stuff she says applies, I think, to photography as well. Uh, and to stay sane in a world where, where a lot of people have an opinion about what you do and who you are, you have to find your compass. You have to find something that is your shelter in the storm. I have a piece of paper with eight names of it that I carry with me at all times. And these eight people are my people with a capital P. It's, some of them are photographers, some of them are not. Uh, all of them love me and are loved by me. Um, they are extremely honest to the point of being painful sometimes. Uh, I know that they will always tell me the truth, but it will come from a place of love. And if someone says something about me or my work, um, before I decide what to do with it, I usually check if their name is on the list, because sometimes you tend to forget. And if it's not, I mean, it's going to stink. Come on, we're photographers. We want the world to like us. But it's not going to change what I do. It's not going to change how I make my decisions. <clears throat> and this brings us, takes us, to the next thing, which is social media. And I know you're supposed to do the whole social media thing. You have, you're supposed to have a bazillion friends, and, unless 
you want to be invisible and not matter, and then you have to kill yourself or something. But uh, I really, the reason it's there is because, in my opinion,